Okay, welcome to part three and the final part of this really incredibly crazy story about what happened to me in my early church life. Where we're at now is we've gone through the pastor's son dying, which was in part one. Pastor's son to which I was engaged died. Part two, the pastor has now been killed. And we're up to part three. Now from part three, I have to go back just a little bit to tell you a couple things that happened before the pastor got killed. As I said in part two, the pastor's youngest son, the one who was insta institutionalized in the mental institution, had some sort of miraculous conversion and was now pious. However, at the time he was living with my, my husband, who later became my husband, he was living with him and carrying on sleeping with men which my husband kept telling him he would have to put him out because that he couldn't have that going on in his house. But he had decided he was, he was called to the ministry, this younger son. Also, during that time, right before the pastor got shot, again, my husband had invited a friend that he worked with to come to church. The guy joined, and that's who, in fact, actually killed the pastor. So they're already upset with me and my husband because... I didn't bring my husband in as replacement for, which I thought was kind of creepy anyway, but as a replacement for the older son that had died. So all of this is going on. I am now beyond traumatized. I am now just, I, I, I can't even begin to explain to you what was going on with me mentally, but I need to tell you another part about me my personality, and it has always been this way from childhood up, if there's ever any kind of emergency situation, I'm the one that you want to have in that situation. Because while the situation is going on, my mind is clear, my mind is concise, I'm figuring out the, the best possible courses of action to take during the situation. I don't get flustered, I don't get upset, I don't fall to pieces. I will see an emergency situation through to the end, and after everything is over and it's all said and done, then I cry. Then I go through all the emotional thing. But while it's going on, I'm going to take care of business. So that's exactly what I did. I took care of business. The pastor had just been killed, and the church was in a turmoil. Everybody was just upset. Let me also tell you this. I never ever wanted to be a pastor, period. Full stop. I never ever in particular wanted to be the pastor of that church, ever. Full stop. I seen how all the people were. I seen how the first family was. I saw all the greed and the corruption and the lies and the just everything that went on. And I thought, God, please don't ever call me to be a pastor of anything because I don't think I would, I don't think I have the patience or the temperament to be able to handle that. And by this time, even though all the false prophecies were saying otherwise, I knew that I was not thinking that. So I knew the prophecies had to be false because I had absolutely no desire to be responsible for the souls of these demonic, crazy people. But I'm still upset. Okay, I'm, I'm upset that the pastor has now died because this is like another close member of this family has just been killed. So being a missionary and a social missionary, it was one of my responsibilities to go to the house and to help out in the house, to cook, to wash the dishes, to, you know, help the first family get through this. There were times it got so depressingly heavy in this house that I would have to go outside and go for a walk. Now, mind you, I told you in the first episode that the house was situated on the other side of the park from where I lived. It was in a neighborhood. There was, I lived in one neighborhood on a main street. There was a park sort of in the middle of this area, and then on the other side of the park is where this family lived. So I would go out for a walk when it got to be just too depressing in there because there was a bunch of people in there uh, from the church and the the clique sort of all just glommed together around these people. I would go out. When I would come back in, everybody would have this, this really hated 
even just hatred even more look for me and I never could figure out why so eventually I said okay I tell you what evidently I'm not wanted at this house so I'm gonna go back to my house okay let them deal with all this stuff I'm gonna go back deal with my grief and try to figure out what's happening and what's going to happen now with this church because like I said I was never upset with God I, I never I actually felt bad because it was like these people are just absolutely ruining anybody's concept of God or anything and it's like I know God isn't like this so I go back to my house at this point and right before the pastor had uh, got killed he started sending me and my husband out to start other churches to help other churches get started all of the stuff that was going on with his family I never saw that stuff in the pastor and he actually had a genuine concern for other people for God and for or for helping the community helping other small churches so he had like a long list of, of people that wanted to start churches or people that had started churches that needed support and needed help in getting things started he knew that I had the education he knew that I had the experience he knew that I had the ability to um, and besides he had taught me a tremendous amount of things about church administration and, and things like that I now believe that he probably saw that or probably thought at that time that I was going to ultimately become a pastor of a church because he taught me everything about being that and doing that the good the bad the ugly everything so he would send me and my husband to go to these small churches to help them get set up and we would go and we would you know there were some people that actually it was just two people who who wanted to start a church but didn't quite know the the ins and outs outs of the administration of a church or how to bring members in or things like that so we would go and we would help these people start these churches so we weren't at the church very much we just happened to be there that Sunday that he got shot and killed so after this everybody that belonged to the church kind of came back together at the church because now the church is without a pastor and amongst the ministers there was a vote that had to take place of who was going to take over the church since the pastor had been killed and there was some time given and everybody was instructed the ministers the missionaries the you know everybody that's on staff was instructed to spend some time in prayer and there would be a secret vote we would write down a name hand it in and whoever was you know they had the most votes they would become the pastor of the church so that gave us time to pray about this and my husband prayed and I prayed we prayed individually we prayed together and I kept praying because the answer I kept getting I, it was probably one of the few times that I thought okay God must be wrong because he's telling me something that I know is not in his best interest in his God's best interest to be the pastor of this church but no matter how many times we prayed no matter how many times we went through it kept coming up with the younger son and it's like God I could see this demon then I thought okay who am I to question God maybe he is going to finally you know do the conversion and help this kid maybe there's something going on that I'm just not aware of because who knows why God does anything this is what I'm thinking at this point so it's like okay that's who it has to be that's who it has to be so the vote is taken evidently God told everybody else about the same thing because that's who everybody voted for so the younger son takes over that's when the fun started <laughs> and I mean that as sarcastically as it sounds we're still spending most of our time helping the smaller churches but we would come back from time to time every time we would come back everybody would just have this weird response to us being there and every time we would come back things would be different security was there security was around the younger pastor people started getting patted down people had to sign loyalty oaths saying that they were going to be loyal to this guy and to the first family and I, I'm not sure because I never signed one but you know, I'm assuming it said something to the fact that you know we're not going to kill you it became a very heavy oppressive atmosphere by this time my husband and I had decided we were going to not be a part of this church anymore 
it had turned into something that took the focus off of God and put the focus on this younger son and what this younger son was doing. He was taking the church in a direction that we just did not feel comfortable being at, and we didn't feel comfortable being at the church. So we had come to the decision that we were going to leave the church. We just weren't sure where we were going to go. Once we had reached that decision, a series of things happened rapidly. One thing that happened, and and some of them happened at the same time, so don't take it as a linear thing, just look at it as things happening all at the same time. My husband had went to the church one Sunday without me. I don't remember what, I think I was at the other church. The, they patted him down, and then the younger son, who at this point was not living with him anymore, because the younger son, after the pastor got killed, moved back into the house of his family. But the younger son called him into the office and told him that he knew that he, my husband, and I had his father killed. My husband was stunned. He, had, he, he, didn't, he didn't see this coming at all. And he said he sat there and his first response was anger. <laughs> his first response was to attack this kid because this kid had just, you know, fooled everybody in this church, used him to fool everybody in this church, and now he's sitting there accusing him of wanting to kill his father through this guy that he brought in from his job. And he, the younger son told him that he was going to have to ask him to leave. At the time this was going on, he and I to leave. My husband asked him, what did he have, what did they have against me? And I was told that while I was at the house, right after the pastor got killed, every time, now this is what I was told that he said, every time I left the house, the phone would ring. This is before cell phones, so I would have had to walk somewhere to a pay phone, that the phone would ring and it would be somebody disguising their voice in a deep, gravelly, demonic-sounding voice saying that the voice had killed the pastor and that the first family was next, and they would make all these threats against the pastor's wife. And this would happen, according to them, every single time I left the house for a walk. And I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> mind you, and you don't have to believe me, but it wasn't me. One thing there was, n- I, I don't know why anybody didn't realize that there was not a payphone near there and the amount of time I was gone was not enough time for me to walk through the neighborhood, through the park, through another, another neighborhood to get back to my house, make a phone call, and then reverse the route. I, I was never gone longer than maybe five minutes at the most, and in order to have done all that, I would have had to have been gone at least 45 minutes, 45 minutes to an hour walking because I didn't have a car, so I was walking the whole time. So anyway... Nobody ever put that together. He told my husband he was asking us to leave the church. And my husband told him, you know, very politely, well, you know what? I was actually coming in here to tell you that we were going to leave the church. So we have all this stuff going on. Still don't know where we're going to go as far as church. But what was happening outside of my private life was that's when I had taken the test to be an air traffic controller. I know nothing about air traffic have no clue anything, didn't even know what an air traffic controller was, but I'm going to go take this test because it's an opportunity, and if God wants us out of this situation, then this test is going to be the way out. I go that Saturday. I take the test. No clue what they're talking about on the test. They did happen to have a section that had puzzles and things like that, and I was always good at that kind of thing, but the other section of it was specific air traffic questions. I had no clue, and I just spent the whole time, went through the test, didn't think anything else about it, went home. A couple weeks later, get this notification in the mail that I had passed this air traffic control test. (laughs) I was absolutely stunned, but I had passed this test, and I had to report to the training facility in Norman, Oklahoma on such and such a date, but I couldn't bring my family. So now we're trying to figure out, okay, where are we gonna put the family? Because we've got all these people that think we're part of this murder plot or something. And it was really, really scary because I'm like, all right, this is absolutely crazy. Like I said, by this time I had had small children, Uh, we were married so we placed the kids someplace I didn't think that they would they would look for them 
My husband was still going back and forth to work, and I, I felt fairly confident that he was able to take care of himself. So, I, you know, that I just was worried that something would happen before I could get through this program, but confident that I could go through this program and eventually bring them with me out of where we were at. So I go through this program. I get to the point where I can bring my family with me. We leave there. And that's how we left the situation there. A little while later, because certain members of the church who never believed that we actually had this plot going on, they would contact my husband. Eventually found out that the young younger brother had everybody, had all the church members there, the ones that didn't leave, that had signed the loyalty oath and that didn't care about being patted down every Sunday. They were buying the younger minister a younger pastor, they were buying his clothes, they bought him a couple cars, they were waiting on his every need and whim, hand and foot. And one Sunday went in to go to service and the doors were locked and they couldn't figure out why the doors were locked. So finally were able to get into the church, the big building where the services usually were held. They got in there, he had sold everything inside the church, every seat, every gutter, the furnace, anything that was made of metal. He sold everything inside the church. He sold everything inside the building across the street. He gutted both buildings, took the money, took the cars, took the clothes, and moved across country. Moved to California, where I'm at now. He didn't move in the city I'm at, but he moved to Southern California, and I live in Southern California now. Now, mind you, I never had, back then, I never had any intention, opportunity, or anything else to move to Southern California. This happened to come up as a result of the air traffic. So, last thing I heard about all of that at that time was that the younger son, the brother that he attacked at the refrigerator back in the first part, and a couple, I think, I'm not sure both sisters, I know, he had three sisters. One of the sisters was always kind of standoffish, like she really wasn't part of all that, but she couldn't really express that. I think the other two sisters came out to California. No, all three of them did. All three of them did, and then the one that was kind of standoffish, she ended up going back. I don't know what happened to the youngest sister, and the oldest sister started a church, the last I heard. The brother that got attacked, I have no clue where, whatever happened to him. I don't want to keep in touch with any of these people, so if any of you are listening, don't contact me. You all caused enough damage in my life. But he, last I heard, was out in California. I have no clue whatever happened to him. The youngest pastor, the youngest guy, the one that caused all of this, oddly enough, I was out here, and I didn't read the local newspaper very much, And one day, I happened to pick up the local newspaper just on a whim. And there was a small story about this youngest pastor being found shot in the head in the front seat of a car. They have no idea who did it, never heard anything else about it. Just they found his body shot in the head, front seat of his car. And I I often think it's God that actually showed me what ended up happening to him because the circumstances that led up to me picking up this newspaper, it was just a miraculous set of things that would lead up to that point anyway. That's pretty much the factual of what happened. I'm going to tell you in this part, I'm going to say strictly my opinion, but this is what I think really happened because I can tell you from my side and my husband's side, my husband's no longer with us. He passed away in 2000. I can tell you that he had absolutely no desire to take over that church or pastor those people, nor did I. And I still don't want to be a pastor. Not just because of that, it's just that I don't want the responsibility of that many souls and that many people on my record. But this is what I think happened. I think the pastor of that church who had visions of doing some really good things for the community, and it was a very economically depressed community, Well, I know he had visions of doing things that would have helped the community that would have been attributed to church and to God, and it would have been a very uplifting experience for the people of that community. And I believe that evil and demonic powers 
And I know there's a lot of people that don't believe that those exist, but they do. I've heard them. I've seen them. I believe that they did not want that to happen. This is what I believe happened. As far as the murder goes, I believe the chain of events that happened to me led me to my husband. My husband, he invited other people to come into the church. And this one guy, though, that actually did the murder, who, again, was like, why are you all tackling me? Why are you all upset God told me to do this? But this guy came into the church, fell in love with the first daughter. I believe the first daughter probably encouraged it. The guy was probably going through things already in terms of losing his house and losing his wife. So he may not have been that mentally... I don't want to say sharp as in against like not being smart, but he may have been stressed already from the beginning. I believe they took advantage of it. I believe the first daughter and I believe the youngest son took advantage of it. I believe the youngest son talked that guy into killing his father. It would not have been difficult to say he's keeping you from the woman that you love. Something needs to be done. You know, here's this gun. That way you guys can be together. I'm sure he probably said something like, you know, God told me to tell you that you need to do this and convinced him that this was, in fact, something God said. Because there's a lot of people out there, and this is how you get cults. This is how you get all those people in Jonestown to drink the Kool-Aid voluntarily, not the ones that were forced with the guns, but the ones voluntarily who drank it. This is how you get people to voluntarily follow some of the most craziest cult ideas that you ever heard, but they believe it and they follow it because what they're actually following are people. They're not taking the time to look in the Bible. They're taking somebody else's word for it on what the Bible says. They're taking somebody else's word for it because of that person's position. They're saying, well, if this is the pastor or if this is the pastor's son or this is the pastor's wife or, or this is the leader of this church and they're saying this, 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 and that God said it's okay, then it must be okay. People are lazy thinkers. They don't want to go into the Word and find it themselves. They don't want the confirmation. They want to be able to listen to somebody else say it and think, okay, well, that must be what God said because, you know, why would this person lie to me? Remember, people are human. People are people. People can tell you anything. Prove if God is telling them something, and this has always served me well, so listen to me closely. If God is telling somebody else something about you and something you should do or something that affects you, he's not just going to tell them. He's going to have it in his word. It's never going to go against what the Bible says. But you're also going to be able to confirm it some other way. Okay, this isn't going to be just some, you know, mysterious thing. And he's going to tell you. And you're not going to be, you know, was that God that told me this? And you're going to know when something is said and it's for you because people really need to stop falling for all this kind of stuff because somebody else said something but i believe that he told him that and that was why he was confused and was saying but god said to do it the reason i believe the older daughter was implicated in it when the false prophecies came through about you wanted to take over this church there was a couple that came actually i think there was two that came in particular that I'm not too sure were false because the person that it was coming through looked extremely surprised by the time it was over. One kept talking about the she and about look at him. They kept saying, look at him. I can do a better job than him. And that's when I started realizing that, no, it wasn't me thinking something or feeling something that I wasn't aware of because I had never had that thought. And I was assuming at the time that the him they were talking about was the pastor. And I had never had that thought about that man, so I knew it wasn't talking about me. That was one of the ones that I think surprised the person that was supposed to be doing this prophecy because she looked very surprised those words were coming out of her mouth. And the second one was she started talking about moving people. She started talking about removing the pastor, and then she started talking about moving And she didn't name people by name, but she started talking about moving people out of the church. She was making motions with their hands on a table. And if you could imagine the map of the United States being on the table, 
and her hand sort of as if she was like grabbing something and picking something up. She, she kept saying that she was going to move this one over here and this one over there, and she was moving things, which I'm assuming were people, to different places on this map, and a couple of them were moved out to where California would be, and that he was going to keep these people separate for a while until it was time for them to do whatever it was that he wanted them to do but he was going to remove them from from this church and from this situation. Those were the only two that I actually believe were real. The young older sister ended up starting a church and then it occurred to me that the older daughter was now called the exact name except for the first name as her father and she had a church and she was trying to build this church. I don't know whether she ever succeeded. I kind of don't think she did because I haven't gone to look because I don't really care. But the last that I was told was that she had this church, she was trying to build this church, but that they had kicked her out of the organization that her father belonged to, which was really interesting because he was deeply entrenched into this organization. Organizations still exist, but she is not part of that organization. So I'm not sure what happened to all of that. She may still be a pastor of a church. I don't know. Uh, the last thing I heard about some of the women that were in that little clique, some of them went on to be pastors, and some of them I don't know what happened to. And again, like I said, I don't really care. It wasn't information that I went seeking. Personally, I just kind of wish they all would, would have forgotten that I existed. So I think the wanting to take over the church would more likely have been referring to the older daughter. So after all of that, you would think that I would not want to step into a church, would not want to be involved in a church, would not believe in a church or believe in God, but it had almost the exact opposite effect of, I believe, what was in the effect it was intended to have. It had almost the exact opposite effect because it caused me to go deeper into my studies. It taught me a tremendous amount of things. It taught me not to believe everything I heard, not to believe everything I saw. It taught me to verify information, if it, whatever the information was, whether it was something just regular information or whether it was biblical information, it taught me to study. It taught me to study beyond what I was taught educationally. It taught me to study and to know God and the character of God and to know who God is and to know that God is because there are a lot of things that are totally unexplainable that happened then during the situation and in my life that there is no other explanation for. So instead of turning me away from God or turning me away from religion or turning me away from church, it actually drew me closer to God. Now, yeah, I do have a problem with certain churches, but the experience showed me that it's the people. It's people and it's not God, and that if God's grace will work with people, no matter where they are, in the church, out of the church, leading a church, not leading a church, then if he still values a person that much, who am I not to value the person? Not what they do or what they say, but the person. And that eventually, if that person recognizes it, they will recognize the fact that God is real and God does exist. And it's my job to help people understand that horrible things happen, no doubt about that, but there is an answer. There is, there is an answer to why, there is an answer to all of the questions about it. And though I had to experience at least 15 lifetimes worth of bizarre, weird stuff, I actually have found a lot of the answers. That's why I wanted to tell you this because people nowadays, especially young people think, oh, church is boring. I don't want my parents' church. I don't want my parents' religion. I don't blame you. I don't want it either. I would not have wanted it either. 
but there's a part to God that you don't understand and that you don't know. And I'm hoping to be able to show you that part. So that's the end. Join me for a new playlist that's going to come up on this channel of Bible studies. So look for the playlist to come up pretty soon. It'll come up within the next couple of weeks. I have a couple other things to do. I have podcasts that I do still here, Adventures in Aging, that looks at aging in America. You can find that podcast on Spotify, Anchor, Google Play, iTunes, anywhere you listen to podcasts. There'll also be a playlist of the podcast. It'll be podcast only, no video on this channel. Thanks for listening, and until the next crazy, creepy, and cool true story, which I already know what the next one's going to be, and it's going to be creepy, I'll see you then.